And uh, a couple of weeks later, the CIA descended on my doorstep. And they said, oh, have we been looking for you? I said, why? What did I do? Well, I have to give you a little bit of my background. <laughs> Following my master's degree uh, at the University of Florida, I went on uh, active duty as a naval intelligence officer, and I ended up at uh, NSA, National Security Agency, at Fort Meade. I liked the job I was doing, so I converted uh, and stayed as a civilian there. And then I went out to Stanford to get my PhD, uh, still an NSA employee. But of course, after living in California in the 60s for a while, I said, do I ever really want to go back to Laurel, Maryland and <laughs> never be able to publish anything? So I resigned. So I graduated uh, with my PhD in 67. I was a postdoc uh, there working on the book, as I mentioned. And actually, I joined SRI only a few months before I happened to do this experiment. Well, that's why they were looking for me. They said, look, we have a problem. The Russians are spending millions of dollars every year, and they have for a long time, on ESP research in their best institutes with their best people, and we don't know why. No one in America, in the scientific community at least, even believes there is such a thing. So we don't know how to evaluate this. And you know, late 60s, early 70s was not the time for the CIA to go to your local university and say, hey, we're interested in psychic spying. Would you like to have a contract or something? <laughs> <laughs> but they saw my background, figured they could trust me, and said, uh, well, you know, would you consider, we see you've been, you know, you've been polygraphed and all that, would you consider having a little contract to find out how this stuff works or whether it really works? And so just as a lark, thinking this would just be a little side story, I said, okay, sure, I'll, I, can, I can do that. And uh, while they were there, they admitted that they, they, they were pretty skeptical themselves still that you know, he could really see inside something. And that's what caught their attention. They couldn't care less that he perturbed it. It was the fact that he saw inside and drew, drew a, a diagram of what it looked like that got their interest. <clears throat> so uh, they said, can we do some experiments of our own with him? I said, sure. And so they spent a day hiding things in boxes, hiding things in envelopes. He would come into the lab. He would describe what was in there. Even when they did something tricky, I remember one time on one of the experiments, he came in and said, well, there's a leaf in the box, but what I don't get is that it's seems to be moving around. Well, in fact, they put a moth in there that looked like a leaf. So that convinced them that that's all they needed, and so they decided to go ahead with the contract. Unfortunately, they took their data with them, so I don't have that data to show you, but I thought that was such a neat experiment that soon after, when I had the chance, I did that experiment with another, uh, as we be begin to build, build up our uh, group of people who could do this kind of thing, I did it with another person, Hella Hammond, and what we did was to place things inside of film cans. Like I'd place a spool and pin inside a film can, she would come into the room and say what she could see in there. So she drew sort of like a cross section of a spool and a pin, put in a curled up leaf, she came up with something all curled up. This gave her a problem. She said, I see a leather belt in there, but I know a leather belt can't fit inside a film can. In fact, it was a a little, little leather belt uh, K-ring. Uh, <clears throat> one time we just filled it with sand, so if you could keep the sand together uh, you, and, and look carefully, you'd see that this structure is exactly in the structure of the can and so on. Now you may think I'm showing you just the best of some long series of data. These were actually the first five that she did. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that, that raised our interest even more. By then, I had added uh, uh, Russell Targ came to join me in the program. And so we started doing experiments like this with Ingo, sort of day in and day out. I mean, we did high-tech versions like, well, turn a laser on in another room. Can you tell when it's on, when it's off, and so on? Or we'll nonetheless hide things in boxes and see what he can see. One day, he came in and said, uh, I'm quitting. We said, why? You're doing great. He said, you want to know what's in the box? Open it up. <laughs> you want to know what's in the envelope? Tear it open. You're trivializing what I can do. I can see anywhere in the planet, 
maybe even off planet, and here you are doing these stupid experiments. So I said, okay, well, what, what do you mean? What, what do you have in mind? He said, just send somebody randomly out in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'll describe where they are. Well, I, that, that was too far out even for us, and so uh, even having seen this data, so we refused to do the experiment, and after a while he finally, he really was going to quit, and so he said, okay, well, tell you what, we'll do some of these on a coffee break, because we don't have to report to our sponsor that we're doing this kind of weird experiment. So in fact, we did a few, and he did well. And so finally, we told our sponsor that, well, it seems like he not only sees inside of superconducting shielded little containers, inside boxes, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, basically he can look out and see things in the environment, in the physical environment of the city. So they said, well, if that's true, they have to remember, they were not happy seeing us get good results because their hope was to prove that this stuff the Russians was, were doing was just nonsense. And so every time we'd get excited about getting a good result, they would get more depressed. So that's just part of what we had to deal with. <clears throat> so anyway, this is what started us off on what we now call remote viewing, which means really viewing remote locations. I'm going to give you some examples of remote viewing to show you what's good about remote viewing and also what's wrong or difficult about remote viewing. Here's remote viewing. This was done uh, later in the program. Uh, by this time, we were training Army intelligence officers from the Army Intelligence and Security Command out of Fort Meade. This particular one was done by Joe McMonigal, sitting here in the fourth row. This is what you'd like remote viewing to always be. We had a very elaborate protocol with all kinds of double-blind things, sending people out into the, the, the San Francisco Bay Area uh, to stand at some site for 30 minutes, and the remote viewer was to make a drawing and give some narration of what he saw. Well, unless you were an artist, you could hardly do better if you were standing there. Well, that's, that's neat. You'd love to see that all the time. But actually, what we usually see is more like this. Here's a case where Hella Hammond was the remote viewer. She's the one that did the CANS experiment. In this case, I was the outbound person, and I was standing on this overpass over the Bayshore Freeway. What she says is, well, I can't quite tell where he is, but there are a lot of things going by fast. But she couldn't tell there were cars. And she said, if you're standing where he is, it sort of looks like that. And it's some kind of diagonal trough up in the air, but it has holes in it so it couldn't carry water. But she couldn't interpret what it was. Well, at the time we thought, well, maybe she's just off today or whatever. But in fact, this is the kind of pattern that finally emerged that people could get flashes and patterns and pieces of a site, but not necessarily if they turned on their analytical mind to try to figure out what it was actually was and tried to interpret what they were seeing, that's usually when they, they would go off base. Here's an example of that. This is done with Pat Price, who's a police commissioner, ex-police commissioner from Burbank. He heard about our program. He said that uh, he had noticed some flashes when they were working on criminal cases that turned out to work. Could he come and volunteer for some experiments? Well, it turned out he was really good. Here's a case where the actual Sorry, actual location was a swimming pool complex, Rinconata Park. He says, I see a circular pool of water, 120 feet in diameter. It's really 110. I see a rectangular pool, 60 by 89 feet. It's really 75 by 100. He described this quite excellently. But actually, what's most interesting about his drawing is what's wrong with it. First of all, you notice there's a left-right reversal. If you're standing at the pool house, that's on the right, not the left. He had a couple of tanks of water that came out of his imagination. They're not there. 
And we ask him what kind of place, because we're not yet under the fact that interpretation is, is a bad route to go down. He said, well, I think it's a water purification plant, and he put machinery in the pools, which weren't there. So he's getting a combination of what appeared to be real data, on the other hand, uh, being what we now call analytical overlay, because as part of our survival mechanism, mechanism we always want to interpret what's happening, because that's good for survival. And so it's, it's very hard to let go of that need to interpret. This is Pat Price uh, in the center. I'll let you guess who the CIA agent is. <laughs> Kit Green, some of us know him. My hair was a little darker and I was a little thinner, but there we are. We were called the plaid pants trio <laughs> once this picture. <laughs> So we did a number of experiments with him. <clears throat> At the time, we had a problem. There were people in SRI who hated that this program was at SRI. They said it's going to ruin our credibility. We're not going to be able to get contracts. So the people at SRI that didn't like us being there and hoped to get rid of us were given the task to figure out how to evaluate this stuff. And so what they came up with was this procedure. You go ahead and do a series of experiments. You randomly number the transcripts. You give a list of the targets that were seen. And then this is what happened. You get a judge who doesn't know which targets go with which transcript. And he goes out to one of the targets, say Hoover Tower. He reads all the transcripts. He says, well, that's the best match. Uh, transcript one is the second best match. This is the third best match, et cetera, et cetera. These are all sort of the same, so I'll give them an average match. Then you go out to the next target, and you read all the same transcripts again. And again, you say, what's the best match, second best match, third best match, et cetera. And then only when we get to the end and we break the code and, and put it in this format do we find that, in fact, seven of the nine times the correct transcript was matched to the correct target. What that means in real terms is if somebody had been kidnapped nine times and you had a list of the possible places that he could have been taken, seven of the nine times you would have gone to the right place first. Of course, the people who designed this were really upset now. <laughs> well, we wondered what is it with these people? How can they do this? In our wisdom, we figured, well, it's probably something different about them physically. So we gave them a bunch of tests. We even included a seven-layer scan of their brains. By the time we got done with that series of tests, and then asked, well, what'd you find? They said, these people are normal. <coughs> They're just normal. So in our wisdom, we decided, OK, well, then it must be neuropsychological or psychological. So we gave them all these tests. <laughs> we got to the end, we knew more about our remote viewers than NASA knew about its astronauts. <laughs> and I said, well, please, you must have found something different. And the psychologist, the only thing he had to say was, well, when I was interviewing Pat Price, I asked him to remember you know, what was his early experiences in life like. And he asked me, do you want me to stick to this lifetime? <laughs> That's about as weird as it got. Well, here we are turning these results into CIA. They're getting nervous. They've now decided, by the way, and hoped, that we must be in collusion with the subjects. They did not want to be seeing this happening. So they sent out a fellow to check us out. He showed up and said, my name's Ed but you can call me Scam Buster. I'm here to see what the fraud is. All right? Well, we'll start doing some experiments. You want to see some regular remote viewing experiments? Yes, that's what I want to see. OK, fine. So we put a uh, remote viewer with an interviewer in the laboratory. We show him our careful procedure. We go to the division director. He uses a random number generator. He goes into the safe. He pulls out an envelope. He gives it to us. We drive to the site. We're there a half hour. We come back. The guy has described it to a T. We're ecstatic. 
He mumbles, you just told him in advance. I said, but you saw her.